Welcome to this webinar on expanding access to care for members of armed services and veterans. I am Sarah Ramaya, Curriculum Designer at ASRM. This webinar is presented jointly by the ASRM Center for Policy and Leadership and the Access to Care Special Interest Group. The moderator of today's webinar is Dr. Christopher Herndon. Dr. Herndon is an assistant professor and uh, medical director in the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Washington. He is past chair of the ASRM Access to Care Special Interest Group and is involved in local and state national initiatives to improve access to care. Before we begin, Please note, this webinar was developed by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members and other reproductive professionals. While this webinar reflects the views of the panelists, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to dictate an exclusive course of treatment. Members should always use their best judgment in determining a course of action and be guided by the needs of the individual patient, available resources, and institutional or cl clinical practice limitations. All attendees will be muted except the presenters. Time at the end of the presentation will be reserved for questions. Please type a question in the question chat window at any time. We will read as many selected questions as possible to the presenters during the allotted question and answer time. A recording of this webinar will be archived on the ASRM website in the coming weeks. Please watch your email for notification. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Herndon to introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Sarah. On behalf of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and the ASRM Access to Care Special Interest Group, it's my privilege to welcome you today to this webinar on expanding access to care for members of the armed services and veterans. In 2015, ASRM launched the Access to Care Initiative as a collaborative call to action for universal access to reproductive care through education, research, clinical innovation, and outreach. Our webinar today is part of a series supported by the ASRM Access to Care Special Interest Group to educate and inform health professionals on barriers that limit access to care and initiatives to address the wide gaps in access to care that exist today in our communities. In 1992, Congress passed legislation that banned the Department of Veteran Affairs from providing IVF coverage. This was partially overridden in September 2016 when Congress authorized funds through the Department of Veteran Affairs to provide adoption assistance and IVF medical treatments to veterans with a service-connected injury or illness that has caused infertility. The passage of the IVF for Vets bill in 2016 was a great achievement and milestone, the result of tireless advocacy by congressional leaders, ASRM, advocacy groups, veterans, and patient advocates. Yet this bill is just a first step. For those with the service-related injury that it provides coverage, their coverage is contingent upon passage of funding every year. Thousands of veterans, as well as thousands of active duty service members who do not qualify for coverage under it and struggle to afford infertility care. As a community, as a nation, we need to do more. Our webinar today, led by an expert panel, will help guide and navigate you through the often complicated and complex landscape of healthcare coverage and service delivery through the Departments of Defense for active duty armed service members and Veteran Affairs for veterans, helping you understand what, veter what fertility services are covered and what facility services are not covered through each. Our panelists will each speak to the limitations of coverage, the barriers in access to care, as well as what you can do to help improve access to care. It is my privilege to introduce our panel for this webinar today. Our first speaker is Dr. Alicia Christie, veteran and former chair of obstetrics and gynecology at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Dr. Christie will outline the coverage that currently exists for active duty service members through the Department of Defense. Our our second speaker is Dr. Jenny Ryan, who's professor at the University of Washington and a former VA physician. Dr. Ryan will explain the pathways, limitations, and eligibility criteria that exist for infertility coverage for our veterans through the VA. Last but not least, our third speaker, Sean Tipton, Tipton is um, Chief Advocacy Policy and Development Officer for ASRM. Sean will, will provide perspective on past, current, and future directions on advocacy and how you can be involved to help expand access to our armed service members and veterans. 
Our webinar will, will close with a 15-minute question and answer session where our panel will answer your questions that can, be, that can be submitted in the course of the webinar. Please note that the slide deck and informational hand handouts that outline the coverage in the DOD, VA, and advocacy tools are available for download uh, in this webinar. Also, please take a moment to fill out a survey at the close of the webinar. As a grateful nation, we should and can do better for our armed service members and veterans who risk their lives for our country. This change can start today from helping veterans and active duty members in your clinic by joining and supporting ASRM Resolve and partners to advocate for legislative change to help active duty armed service members and veterans across the country struggling with infertility obtain the medical care they need to build families and realize their dreams. It is my pleasure now to turn the webinar over to our first speaker, Dr. Christie. Thank you, Dr. Herndon. I would like to begin by thanking ASRM and its members for their advocacy on behalf of active duty service members and veterans. As a woman veteran, I greatly appreciate your interest in expanding care for those who served. The portrait in the left lower hand corner is an Army colleague of mine who was lost at the Pentagon on 9-11. We recently dedicated a special issue on reproductive health issues in active duty women and women veterans to her. I have no disclosures. I'd like to start by giving um, an estimate of the prevalence of infertility in DOD. And this is an estimate uh, because that's one of the gaps in research. There are 1.2 million active duty service members. 794,000 eligible family members are under the age of 40. If the prevalence is similar to the general population, Somewhere between 95,000 and 110,000 service members and their beneficiaries may need infertility services. I'd like to uh, do a case example uh, and talk about some of the services that are available and some of the gaps. Uh, so this case example is a 27-year-old male active duty service member who was treated with multi-agent chemotherapy and now has azospermia. Prior to treatment, he had a normal semen analysis and he cryopreserved semen. His 25-year-old spouse has bilateral tubal occlusion on HSG. The REI provider evaluating the couple recommends IVF. So some, some questions uh, to organize the discussion. Did he qualify for TRICARE coverage of the cryopreservation of his sperm? Did he qualify for IVF covered by TRICARE? If he is eligible for IVF, is he also eligible for IVF ICSI? If he needs donor sperm, would he still qualify? If he's eligible for IVF, would donor oocytes be covered? Would surrogacy be covered? If he and his partner are not married, would his partner qualify for any TRICARE covered services? If he and his spouse are candidates for IUI, does TRICARE cover the cost of sperm preparation? So let me now go over some of the basic infertility services. Basic infertility evaluation and treatments are TRICARE covered services. And this includes correcting any physical cause of infertility uh, such as reproductive surgery for septum removal, myomectomy, or tubal surgery. It does not include assisted reproductive technology, including IVF. TRICARE will pay for testing such as semen analysis, along with special sperm function tests, hormone evaluation, chromosomal studies, immunologic studies, and bacteriologic investigation. TRICARE covers medications such as clomiphene citrate and letrozole used for ovulation induction. Injectable gonadotropins are, re are restricted to subspecialties, and they're only provided at a few military treatment facilities. Civilian subspecialists cannot order these medications for treatments outside of the military treatment facilities. TRICARE does not include artificial or interuterine insemination. And it also does not cover the costs associated with donor oocyte or donor sperm. In terms of what is covered for ART IVF services, 
Uh, the eligibility requirements include having a serious injury or illness that results in the loss of natural reproductive ability. In those cases, um, these active duty service members and their beneficiaries can be offered fully covered services with autologous gametes. If active duty service members are eligible for DOD covered IVF, they can go to private clinics, but the clinic needs to be in the DOD network or have a contractual agreement with them. And some of the services that are covered include sperm or egg retrieval, IVF, artificial insemination, uh, blastocyst implantation or embryo transfer, cryopreservation and storage of embryos. At this time, fertility preservation for non-medical indications, donor sperm, donor egg, and surrogacy are not covered benefits. And the citation for um, the legislation related to IVF services is at the bottom of the slide. There are a few DOD IVF centers, uh, active duty service members and their spouses who are not eligible for DOD authorized IVF can receive reduced cost ART IVF at the locations shown in the map below. The annual cycle number varies from less than 100 to over 600, with Walter Reed uh, located in Bethesda having the highest number of cycles and also uh, has a fellowship which is co-sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. So returning to the case example, uh, does the active duty service member qualify for TRICARE coverage of the cryopreservation of his sperm? And the answer is yes, because it's for medical indications. Does he qualify for IVF covered by TRICARE? Yes. If he's eligible for IVF, is he also eligible for IVF ICSI? And the answer to that is also yes. If he needs donor sperm, would he qualify? In that case, he would not. If he's eligible for IVF, would donor oocytes be covered? No, surrogacy would also not be covered. If he and his partner are not married, would his partner qualify for any TRICARE covered services? And the answer again to that is no. If he and his spouse are candidates for IUI, does TRICARE cover the cost of sperm preparation? And because he's eligible for IVF services, in that case, they would cover it. So now we move on to the poll question. Which of the following services are not covered by TRICARE? Donor sperm, donor oocyte, surrogacy, IVF after fertility preservation and gamete cryopreservation, and lastly, D, all of the above. And it was 100%. Which of the following are eligibility criteria for IVF services under TRICARE? Surveil illness or injury causing infertility, legal marriage, the ability to produce autologous gametes, or all of the above. All right, let's close the poll and move on to the answers. So the answer is all of the above. Uh, severe illness or injury causing infertility is one of the requirements, uh, but does not, is not the sole requirement. ART IVF uh, that's not covered for active duty service members that don't have a serious injury illness resulting in the loss of natural reproductive ability. And that's the first and most significant requirement. Uh, legal marriage is required for all services for the non-military partner. Donor sperm, donor oocyte, and surrogacy are not covered. IVF after fertility preservation and gamete cryopreservation is not covered. Sperm preparation for insemination is not covered if the couple's not eligible for IVF. Gamete and embryo cryopreservation is not covered if they're not eligible for IVF. Or gamete cryopreservation would also not be covered if the active duty service member does not have a medical indication for fertility preservation. And even in those couples that are eligible for DOD covered IVF, selective reduction for high order multiples is not a covered service. 
So moving on to some of the research gaps. Uh, research to examine causal relationship between military exposures and infertility is needed. Uh, we also need to have more epidemiologic studies to determine prevalence. And epidemiologic information comparing active duty service members in the general population in terms of infertility diagnoses and outcomes. In this slide, uh, which is uh, available to download, these are the links for those of you who might be interested in becoming a TRICARE provider. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jenny Ryan. Dr. Ryan is a professor at the University of Washington. And Dr. Ryan will explain the pathways, limitations, and eligibility criteria that exists for infertility coverage for our veterans through the VA. Dr. Ryan. Thanks so much, Dr. Christie. Um, it's been a real privilege to work in recent years with Dr. Christie and other dedicated staff at Women's Health Services at the VA. Um, and it's great to be with you on the panel today and to be part of this esteemed panel um, representing ASRM. Um, so, so I have nothing to disclose today. Um, a lot of what I'll be talking about will sound quite familiar um, because basically the VA um, has modeled their coverage for a lot of infertility care um, after DOD um, uh, provisions as well. And so you'll hear a lot of similar um, restrictions. Um, but I want to start by just focusing on actually the, um, the quite good care that's available to um, all enrolled um, veterans um, who under their medical benefits package. So on this slide, you can see the basic eligibility requirements to be enrolled um, at the VA and, then, and thus be eligible for the, the medical benefits package. Um, and so basically, if anybody has served in active military, naval, or air service and separated under any, any reason other than dishonorable uh, discharge. And then also current or former members of the reserves or National Guard, and that's importantly to know that the current members um, are involved here. Um, and so reserves or National Guard called, who had been called to active duty, um, not for training only, and completed that full period for which they were called or ordered. Um, but I, I never assumed that I understand all of the eligibility criteria at all um, for, for um, VA healthcare. And so um, veterans really should be encouraged to apply to determine their enrollment eligibility. Um, if you have the opportunity to do that, that, is, that can be very helpful. So under this medical benefits package, this is a quote um, that comes out of the Office of Women's Health Services. Uh, where Dr. Christie works. Um, and again, I've been very impressed with their dedication to um, optimizing and improving infertility care for, um, for women veterans and their, and their spouses. Um, so the VA is truly committed to promote, preserve, and restore the health and well-being of veterans. And Women's Health Services identifies how important um, children are and family building is to, um, to veterans and to, of course, the greater community as well. Um, and so treatment of infertility may contribute to the promotion, preservation, and restoration of the health and well-being of veterans. That's sort of the introductory mission statement um, from the medical benefits package um, description of the infertility care coverage. Um, and I'll just take the opportunity to point out that we have attached um, the directives um, in this webinar as, one of the hand as two of the handouts. Um, so you can see precisely, you can actually see this quote um, and see precisely what is offered to, again, all enrolled veterans. And that's through Directive 1332, which I'll give you some more details about. So this is a snapshot of that directive, which has been re fairly recently amended. Um, and this is publicly available as well. So if you don't have a chance to, um, get a hold of this directive through this webinar and uh, keep it somewhere safe, then you can always look it up. Um, it's publicly available. 
Um, and so this is again, the directive that covers um, the medical benefits package, infertility coverage for all enrolled veterans. Now importantly, this does not include the veteran's spouse. Um, and obviously in the world of infertility, that's kind of a key exclusion uh, criterion. And we'll talk a little bit more about what else is excluded. Um, but again, to start with the focus on actually um, how broad the coverage is um, and, and better than many um, you know, private insurance packages out there um, for folks that we care for in the world of infertility. So these are the covered benefits for all women veterans. You can see that it's, it's quite extensive, involves genetic counseling, includes genetic counseling, um, kind of the gamut of standard infertility um, tests to try to identify the etiology of the infertility. And also you can see reversal of tubal ligation um, is something that is very hard to find these days um, in private insurance packages. Um, and then patients can undergo, um, can use oral and injectable medications and can have the female component of the intrauterine insemination, so the actual insemination, if not the um, cost of the preparation um, covered under the medical benefits package. And again, importantly to draw your attention as Dr. Christie did to oocyte cryopreservation for medically indicated conditions under this medical benefit package. So again, quite broad and, and a good reason to encourage folks who've ever had military experience or are in the Reserve and National Guard or have been to consider um, becoming enrolled in the VA. And then this is the parallel coverage for male veterans. And you can see again, it's quite broad diagnostic, evaluation and treatment for erectile dysfunction, surgical correction, vasectomy reversal, which again is something that is not often um, available in private insurance packages. And then this is a nice handout um, available from the VA and it does a good, it's acting today in our webinar for as a segue between talking about the medical benefits package and then talking about what's excluded from the medical benefits package, which you will have noted, um, is coverage of the spouse, who's a non-veteran spouse, um, and um, IVF coverage. So you can see here on the left column, it basically summarizes what we've just gone through um, for who is eligible for infertility services under the medical benefits package, which is again described in Directive 1332. And then the question is, what about in vitro fertilization and who is eligible? And that's where you'll see a lot of parallels again with the DOD coverage. And we'll go into more detail about that. You can see that the infertility um, work that's being done, I would say, um, is again, generally through women's health, um, working of course in conjunction with urology, um, but generally is headed up by women's health. So information for um, veterans can be found um, on the womenshealth.va.gov um, web pages. So the other directive that I've that we've attached is Directive 1334, and that is very hot off the press, um, just from March 12th of this year. It's finalized, and it talks about um, again care that is um, excluded from the medical benefits package. Um, specifically for in vitro fertilization um, and also care of a non-veteran spouse. The key, again, requirement of this, as Dr. Christie pointed out, and it, again, so is in parallel with the DOD, is the requirement that the veteran be service-connected um, to a disability that can be associated with their infertility. So this again, um, not to um, try to uh, be too repetitive about it, but it's a, it's a common misconception. That, that requirement is not there at all for Directive 1332 or the medical benefits package. That is available to all enrolled veterans. But in order to access the coverage for in vitro fertilization or for in fact any infertility um, care for the non-veteran spouse, 
even less technical than IVF, then you do have to have that veteran have a service-connected disability that can be tied to their infertility. So you can see here in the top row, the difference between the medical benefits package um, and the IVF coverage, which is the difference between an all enrolled veterans and certain veterans and their spouses. Um, you can basically consider that the services um, are the same, so everything under the medical benefits package for 1334, but then in addition, the IVF, and again, in addition, you can then have coverage for the non veteran spouse. Um, importantly, it says, as you see in the very top row, lawful eligible spouses. So this is where some of the restrictions come in. That spouse has to be um, legally married to the veteran. Here again, there's the service connection requirement in the third row down, which again is not, not required for the medical benefits package coverage, but is required for the IVF or legal spouse coverage. Now this, uh, importantly, as, as pointed out, should be determined at the local facility level. That's where it can become quite um, complicated and tricky um, to make that connection. Um, much of the time, the VA relies upon infertility specialists in the local community to help make that connection um, and that determination. And so that's a role for, um, an important role for ASRM members out there who may be taking care of veterans um, and may be contracted to care for um, veterans or DOD folks. Um, the next row you'll see again is this marital status requirement, which again is not at all required for the medical benefits package, but is unfortunately required for the IVF coverage or the care for the um, lawfully married spouse. Um, the medical benefits package, again, does not require that couples have opposite sex gametes. Um, but what that means for the IVF coverage is that within that, that heterosexual married couple, that they're, they have to, we have to be able to use their autologous eggs and the autologous sperm. So no donor sperm or eggs um, possible. Um, IUI, you'll see there's a little bit of a difference there because now you can have both components of the IUI covered. Um, since both opposite sex um, members of the couple would be covered under that directive. IVF is again covered, cryopreservation preservation for gametes um, is covered, and then this is a relatively new addition and quite nice that the cryopreservation of gametes and embryos is covered until the death um, of the veteran or divorce, if we're talking about um, embryos. So, you know, just to be clear, the reason that this can be experienced as such a restrictive um, uh, coverage is because the VA then cannot provide care or um, cover the care, cost of care if there needs to be donated sperm, donated eggs or embryos, or a gestational surrogate. Um, this, in practice, then... Um, rules out anybody except for cisgender, opposite sex, legally married couples. Um, this can be a problem, uh, you know, again, for people who, and it's frustrating because it can be the very, a problem for the very veterans that you might say most um, deserve the coverage. So you can imagine an, a traumatic IED injury and loss of, of uh, you know, traumatic orchiectomies, um, and then not being able to have autologous sperm and use that for IVF, um, that veteran wouldn't be covered, uh, for example. And it also, the restriction in requiring a, a service-connected disability association with infertility can be particularly restrictive for women veterans um, because things like age have a significant effect on women. Um, there's a the unexplained infertility is a significant portion of our population. And it's very hard, as you can imagine, to associate those with a particular service-connected um, disability. As far as what's covered um, through the VA for the IVF services, this can be a little bit tricky. Um, but basically, six up to six IVF attempts are covered and up to three completed cycles. So a completed cycle basically anytime an embryo or embryos 
is or are transferred into the uterus. Um, an attempt um, is any time that an egg retrieval um, occurs. Um, and then number two here is a little bit tricky. If a cryopreserved embryo is thawed or rewarmed and is not viable and thus is not transferred, that counts as an attempt as well. So you can see um, that that can be a little bit tricky. And one of the tricky parts of that too is to try to keep track of what has been done if a veteran moves between centers. So what happens for veterans who are not eligible um, because of those various restrictions? There are some great programs out in the community um, and ASRM has been part of that and in partnership with Resolve um, has been part of continuing to encourage um, both members to uh, contract with, uh, with the VA to provide services and to also um, provide services at a discounted rate. Um, Resolve has this nice website where you can go on there and look at both TRICARE benefits, again, military facilities that Dr. Christie had pointed out that offer treatment, and then you can see the drop down for the discount programs as well. Um, so it's important that anybody providing care for veterans um, uh, is aware of these programs that are out there. So one of the big ones is the Bob Woodruff um, Foundation, and that's this VIVA program at the top. Um, it's one of their main focus um, areas, and basically um, they provide $5,000 to a veteran to, to help out if they're not eligible um, for coverage through the VA. Um, and it's a relatively simple um, and pretty quick process to get that coverage. Um, and then uh, Faring, so some of the drug companies out there, Faring and EMD Serono have some discount, discounted to free programs for um, IVF medications for veterans that are not eligible. So that is it for my portion of the um, presentation, and I'm really delighted to hand it over to Sean Tipton. Um, Sean is the Chief Advocacy and Policy Officer at ASRM's J. Benjamin Younger Office of Public Affairs in DC, and I have had the pleasure of working a little bit with Sean. He's a smart, savvy, and dedicated advocate and a wealth of knowledge and experience in this area, so Sean, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Ryan. Thanks, everybody, uh, for, for all your attention. Um, I'm going to go through some, some of these first couple slides pretty quickly because really what you've seen in, in Dr. Ryan and Dr. Christie's presentations are sort of the, the real nitty gritty details of, in, in some ways, how to uh, the, the, how you can get around a somewhat limited system or an extremely limited system, I would say. Um, my job is to try to remove some of those limits and we're going to talk about how we have done that so far and what we're trying to do moving forward. So. Uh, as Dr. Hunter mentioned at the beginning, um, in 1992, Congress passed a bill that included language completely prohibiting the VA from offering IVF at all. And I will tell you, as we started looking into improving access at the VA system, uh, it took us a long time to find that, uh, embarrassingly enough, but, but that was, it was a provision buried in there. I really know nothing about its passage, but we had to deal with it. And so we, uh, for several years, around two, starting about 2013 or 14, started working on legislation to undo that and to get the VA to uh, to be able to to provide care. And I will say the personnel at the VA very much want to provide this care. They are they are constrained by some of the decisions Congress has made. So, um, and interestingly, the the politics was quite interesting. We got into um, a situation where we needed to get a fix and we couldn't. We were working with the then Republican controlled Congress and the, the veterans committees. We would have, we'd be feel like we we're making very good progress. Um, we would have some good hearings, the chairs and everybody would be friendly. We would feel like we were moving and then it would just come to a screaming halt. And we had a difficult time discerning why that was happening. As it turned out, it was the work of some of the anti-choice groups who were concerned with the question of the government being involved in a procedure which was going to create embryos. And they wanted to control the disposition of those embryos and not allow the patients to have that control. 
So they were, they were working to sabotage the bill. They would not oppose it publicly, but they did privately. And if you're an ambitious member of the Republican party, you care a lot about what the anti-choice community thinks about policy questions. And so they were successfully able to bottle it up. So we turn to an appropriation strategy. So um, on this slide, if you, uh, and actually, you know, this one just kind of rehashes the, uh, what we've talked about some of the limitations. On this one, if you look down at the bottom where it says section 24 seven, um, those first three words, notwithstanding any other provision, so actually four words, I guess, and of law, if you can't count all six, one over six words, notwithstanding any other provision of law, what you do is you go to the appropriators who have to pass a bill that spends money every year, and you can get things in there that will say, we don't care what the statute says historically, this is what it's going to say for this fiscal year having to do with this money. And so Patty Murray from Washington, who was the ranking member of the Veterans Affairs Appropriations Committee, worked in a, in a stalwart a fertility champion, uh, got this language in there basically saying, we don't care what the previous language says, here's some money for the VA, and we want them to do some IVF, and we're gonna, they're gonna follow the DOD TRICARE policy. So that allowed at least the kind of limited access and some of the programs that Dr. Ryan was just describing to begin to happen and some of the things that Dr. Christie is working on. So we have made, that was an important development, um, but it was not at all sufficient. So we have some more work to do. Um, there's some challenges with doing it this way. One is we have to pass this language every year. So that requires work on our part. It's always a little risky. Um, the politics can get a little tricky because there's no way to do this for free. Infertility services do in fact cost money. And there's lots of worthy demands for some of those funds. And so, so it's a little tricky. Um, we have been looking at some ways to do, to help us on what some of, on some of the restrictive procedural aspects. For example, uh, in chasing a bill that would allow DOD and TRICARE to have to provide full coverage, um, the subcommittee where that is in the Congress has a rule that says, if you're gonna do something like, like that, you have to offset the costs and those costs have to be within the jurisdiction of that same committee. So we can't, for example, say, how about you, you buy one less, one fewer new fighter and spend that money instead on IVF services for your for all your employees. It has to be a personnel matter, which in, which in reality means you have to take it out of salary or pensions of the military. And that's a very unpopular approach. Uh, so we're having to look for other solutions to that. Um, there are several bills that have been introduced. Um, our friends in Washington State, Senator Murray and her counterpart over on the House side, Representative Larson, uh, have a bill that's going to permanently authorize the veterans. Um, Senators Booker and Congresswoman DeLauro and Wasserman uh, have a real nice broad bill that's going to uh, provide coverage for all federal employees, something that we would really be in favor of. Um, just last month, we had a new bill introduced by Representative Brownlee. We think Deborah, David Wasserman Schultz is going to do yet another one. So there's a lot of stuff happening. The Again, the procedures and the politics are going to get quite tricky, and I'll talk about that in a second. First, I did want to share this slide. These are some of the key players whose names I just mentioned. Um, and because I know you all are all very, very well-educated medical personnel, specializing in reproductive health and medicine. I'm gonna ask you if you see something that all four of these people have in common. And yes, in fact, they're all women. Uh, and, and I think that's significant. Um, uh, you know, they women care more, more about reproduction. We have found in, in our state work that states with more females in the legislature are more likely to pass IVF mandates. And so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big factor. And these four are all people who we should thank and we're going to continue to lean on. So what are we going to do tactically? We, we think in general support is pretty widespread. When we go and talk to members of Congress, they think, yes, we should be taking care of our active duty military and our veterans for their reproductive care. There are concerns about cost. Um, we are working now on developing our own cost estimates because there is going to be an official what's known as a score from the Congressional Budget Office. There's gonna be an official estimate as to what this benefit would cost. Um, and we wanna have an estimate out first because we know how the CBO works and it's gonna be a high number. Um, so we're gonna, we're working on that as we speak. We think that, that we'll have something out probably later in the spring or early summer. 
Um, we are, as I said, we're seeking a permanent fix and we're gonna need an offset for that. Not a lot of great options. Um, we, we did learn in the VA fight that the anti-choice crowd will oppose some of this stuff and we'll do it quietly. We ultimately suspect that, particularly with the help of Congresswoman DeLauro, who chairs the Appropriations Committee in the House, and just happens to be ASR and President Hugh Taylor's Congresswoman, um, we think she's gonna be able to help us get something on another appropriations bill. So what we're gonna be doing in the next couple of years and the next several months is making a lot of noise um, to try to set the stage for something to get passed in, uh, in a moving vehicle, probably an appropriation bill. So then the question is for you as an ASRM member, what do you need, what can you do to help? So the first thing I would say is pay attention. We will let you know probably via email when there is a legislative development, when we need you to contact your member of Congress, uh, maybe do something else. For example, uh, I would urge all of you to sign up and to attend the Advocacy Day program that we do with Resolve. That's gonna be June 17th. Most of those visits are gonna be virtual, so you're not gonna have to come to DC. Uh, and that's a really good way to get things started and to help us spread the word about this important initiative. And I think on an ongoing basis, the more you can do to develop relationships with policymakers, the more helpful that's going to be to us when we need to tap those those members. So uh, I, I think the bottom line is we're I would love to think that in a year or maybe two years, the presentations that were just given by Dr. Christine, Dr. Ryan would look very different. And it would be a simple matter to say, yes, if you are or ever have been in the United States military, we are going to take care of your reproductive medical needs because it's the right thing to do. So that's what ASRM is working on. And we're going to need all of your help and I appreciate your time and attention at this time. And I think with that, we are now ready to go into the Q&A section of this webinar. Our first question from our audience is, um, is to um, uh, Dr. Ryan. Are you able to describe some of the conditions that a veteran would be eligible for VA and fertility services? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, again, it is, it is tricky um, because they clearly weren't sort of written with the idea of being connected to um, infertility in mind. Um, but the, the easiest ones are if a, if a veteran during his or her um, active duty military service was diagnosed with something that can be linked. Um, that because, so if, if a woman was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome or endometriosis during their service, then that um, is an easy link. Um, so it's actually, it brings up a good point that it's, um, I think, part of the work that could be done to improve access is to just encourage um, an understanding of the, these required connections so that a uh, service, um, uh, so infertility care providers or just women's health providers um, in the DOD are kind of asking about these things. I think that there can be a, a general um, um, sort of hesitancy on the part of women in active duty military to perhaps talk about the reproductive care, their desires for family building, and those, so these things may not come up. But basically, if something is diagnosed during service, then that is, you know, that is automatically a service connected issue and then you can connect that to infertility later on um, otherwise one that comes up a lot uh, and that that my research group and others are really interested in looking at are um, are any connections that there could be with military sexual trauma so anybody um, who's experienced military sexual trauma has um, has automatic um, coverage uh, at, you know in the VA for life I think um, and so there may be some connections there with sexual dysfunction, um, with PTSD, um, and so there's some interesting potential connections between PTSD and infertility, for example. Um, so those are, you know, those are a few that come up. Sometimes, you know, a, a veteran can go back um, and seek um, uh, to, to be retro effectively, retroactively um, associated. So sometimes we'll see somebody who's been exposed to radiation during their um, their military service and um, uh, they can we see perhaps a problem with sperm counts um, and then they can kind of go back and, and request to be service connected for that uh, radiation exposure for example but that can take a long time um, and can be difficult and so if time is of the essence especially that can be um, uh, you know unfortunately a barrier 
Thank you. Um, our next audience question is for Dr. Christie. Um, the question is, so we are in the middle of a permanent change of station move. I have an infertility diagnosis and our next step is IVF. When completing my EFMP medical form to help us get closer to an MTF, our doctor put infertility on my EFMP. Well, long story short, I got the runaround for six months. What can be done to help uh, members moving forward? Um, is specifically the question about helping members to access IVF services. It's uh, more difficult with the military because um, it's a requirement for IVF for a category two or category three injury or illness, which means you're so severely ill or injured, you're unlikely be, to be able to stay on active duty, which is different than having a service connected condition uh, like PCOS. And so the eligibility criteria for active duty service members and in, in their family are um, often more of a barrier than it is for, for veterans. Uh, but I think it is important to start the documentation in terms of service-connected condition. Now, the service-connected conditions are, are well, service-connected conditions are determined by the veterans benefit office and they are usually linked to for instance organ systems so you can't be service connected for infertility you can be service connected for a condition causing infertility so for instance you could be service connected for endometriosis causing infertility uh, but you can't be service connected uh, specifically for infertility so um, I would say uh, the thing to do is to um, work with your provider to make sure that the medical documentation is there because that's what's going to be relied upon for service connection. Unfortunately, for IVF benefits uh, for active duty, uh, it's often very difficult to meet the eligibility criteria. Um, our, thank you, um, Dr. Christie. Our next question is for, um, uh, for uh, Sean. Um, the question is, it is upsetting that even our armed services veterans have, who have given so much for our country do not have IVF coverage. But in your experience and perspective, does that speak to the challenges of one day obtaining IVF coverage for all federal employees? Uh, yeah, that's an, that's an interesting perspective. I mean, um, obviously, uh, at ASRM, our goal is is access to care for everyone who needs it. Um, we have had some discussions around trying to get coverage into the federal employee health benefits package. One of the reasons politically that we're going to try to get it for active duty military first is we think they have a very sympathetic case. And then our hope is we'll, you know, it'll set an important precedent, including a precedent. And this is something that we see a lot in the private sector. Mm -hmm. that in fact you can provide these services for less money than people seem to think you can and and so we're hoping that you know there's going to be this controversy oh you're going to spend all this money and then we'll find out in the real world it's actually not that expensive and that we hope that it'll set the stage then for us to get coverage for all employees for all federal employees and and and, I, and again we think that's an important thing to do for the federal government just as the right thing to do okay. Thank you very much. Um, the next question um, that we have is for Dr. Christie, is how we in the medical field can best support active duty armed service members in building families who are not married or LGBTQ. In, in your view, are there pathways to make the coverage in the future more inclusive? Well, I think um, Sean could probably answer that question better than I can, but I think the most important thing is advocacy and what i i tell my patients is um advocate for yourself with your representative with your senator with your your congressperson with um veteran support organizations and so i would say advocacy uh particularly legislative advocacy um is probably going to be the most uh, effective way to expand services Okay, thank you. I love that answer, Dr. Christie. 
And um, the next uh, question is to Dr. Ryan. Um, you spoke earlier about some of the reproductive health needs that seem they're specific to the veteran population. Is there been data that has looked at treatment outcomes such as respect to IVF in the veterans population? Um, not that I'm familiar with. So, um, but the, um, the VA is actively wanting to do that follow-up for the, you know, this has only been in place for since 2017 that this IVF coverage has been available for veterans. And so I know that they're working with um, the CDC to try to track outcomes um, for those veterans. Right now it's not, you know, it's not a reportable, say for, for SART or anything, whether somebody is um, mm -hmm. a veteran or not. And so it's a bit difficult to go back. And again, because also almost all of the, I mean, basically all of the coverage is provided in the community um, unless it's, yeah, I mean, basically it's all provided in the community. There are no VA centers with doing IVF. They're doing potentially some other infertility work. But um, so it's a bit hard to then to then go back and track that. Um, so that'll be um, important. I just wanted to make a, a follow-on comment. Uh, my office is working with the CDC. We have a, an MOU with them. And so we're providing them identifiers so that they can uh, identify the veterans in the SART cores data and we are preparing uh, a report for Congress. I can't give you a date when that will be available, but that information is, is being tracked and will be reported. Uh, 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 thank you both. Um, our next audience question is, uh, is, is for Sean. How is ASRM partnering with ACE, uh, the ACOG and other organizations to provide unified comprehensive reproductive care for VA active military and spouses? So, um, I mean, ACOG and the AUA and others ha certainly have been supportive. It is not uh, a top priority uh, issue for them, but when we have a specific ask, they're very, they are, have been very helpful. Um, in terms of a comprehensive, and we, we certainly, we certainly talk with ACOG's uh, advocacy staff about sort of what the needs are and, and, and do it that way. So I would say informally, it's a, it's a pretty tight relationship. Um, it's not like we come out with a whole lot of joint um, position papers and things, but, mm -hmm. but we could look into doing more of that, I suppose. Okay. Uh, I serve on the um, Committee for Healthcare for Underserved Women, and that's the committee that addresses issues for active duty women and women veterans. And uh, Dr. Jamila Parrott is the chair of that committee. Um, I, a number of years ago, probably in 2018, uh, we published a, a committee opinion um, about reproductive health care for active duty women and women veterans. But that would be the ACOG committee um, that is um, concerned with those issues. And the VP of uh, Clinical Affairs, uh, Chris Zahn, is retired Air Force. So he really does advocate for active duty women and, and women veterans. Thank you. The question um, uh, also for you, Dr. Kirsty, how does an infertility clinic uh, contract to provide infertility care for, the, for IVF or the DOD? Um, it would be through, and on uh, slide 17 in the, in the slide set, there's a link uh, for the site where you can go to get information about being a TRICARE provider. Uh, there are also, and I'm not sure if there are links on, on ASRM uh, currently, where you can get information about being a VA infertility uh, provider. Um, however, the care in both cases has to be authorized. So it's not a matter of an individual active duty service member or family member or veteran can uh, see you not under an authorization and then get reimbursed. The care has to first be authorized. And within the military, it's usually only authorized if it's the service is either not available in the military or there would be a significant wait time or some other barrier that would be a justification for having the care in the community. Thank you, if Dr. I, if I, yes. Can I add to that, Chris? Just to, just to say that I think, um, one thing that SRM members or 
infertility care providers out there can can do to help is to um, make it part of the practice to ask their patients um, if they have any um, military service background, if they're veteran, um, and to also educate themselves and their financial counselors um, because there may be you know opportunities for coverage um, that uh, that that the patient themselves is not aware of. Um, there may be then the opportunity to realize that there's a population that you can then care for um, as being a contracted provider, um, or and or you also may uh, feel moved to have a whole you know a separate sort of discount program for people in the military who may not be able to access those benefits that are out there. So I think just asking the question is a really um, important thing, and also from the standpoint of um, given the prevalence of, again, sexual trauma in women in the military, I think it's really important from a trauma-informed care perspective to have that understanding of if your patient has that experience as well. Yeah, those are really great points, uh, Dr. Ryan. Our final question uh, for the panel is for, um, is for Sean. I, uh, the question is, I work at an IVF clinic and I want to help our armed service members and vets get the care they need. How can I take action? Should I write my congressperson? What, in your view, would be the uh, the best first step? Yeah, I, I think contacting your your congresspeople is a really good idea. Um, I think, as as Dr. Ryan just mentioned, I think making sure that you get information about the military service status on your patients uh, can be very useful. Um, telling stories really, really works with policymakers. So. I know, uh, you know, many of you as scientists and, and medical professionals, you're data driven and you're very empirical and, and all that is great. That doesn't mean a whole lot to a lot of policymakers, but to just imagine telling them the story of here, I have this woman coming in, she needs help. Try, she's trying to build her family. She served her country. She's now having trouble getting pregnant and she's gonna have to spend a lot of money because the she's not eligible under the policy set by Congress. Um, that's going to be a heart wrenching story. And the more they hear those stories, the more we're going to be able to move policy. So I think that's important. I, I think setting up, you know, now in this kind of age, setting up sort of a, a Zoom webinar to invite some policymakers and their staffs to meet with some of the, the veteran patients and so they can hear those stories directly. Those kind of things make a real, real difference. And then the other thing I would say is, yeah, educate yourself as to the programs like that of the Bob Woodruff Foundation and other things like that. So you have some concrete things to try to that can try to help some of these patients. Thank you very much. I want to, um, uh, at, at the close of our webinar today, I want to thank um, all of our panelists for sharing such a wonderful um, uh, uh, information and their perspectives. I'd like to thank uh, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine and Sarah Maya for coordinating this webinar. I will um, uh, uh, hand it over uh, to her. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for moderating such a fantastic session. And thank you to our panelists for bringing such an important topic up for discussion. And to the attendees, thank you for joining us. You will receive a survey by email after this session. Your feedback helps us give you the most relevant con uh, content and your input is appreciated. This session was recorded and will be available on our website in the near future. Please watch your email for notification about future webinars. For any further questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinars at ASRM.org. This concludes the webinar.